taken. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But he beat on his chest, saying, But thou be merciful to me, a sinner. I say unto you, This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, you know, this is kind of a deep parable that, according to Luke, who was a physician, according to history, is talking about here. Luke represents light or enlightenment, the enlightenment of the spirit. All of us are beings of light. And so here is this enlightened scripture that Luke is sharing. And he's talking about something that we hear every day if you pay any attention to the news. We hear this one is better than that one, right? He did this, she did that, he said this, she said that. How many of you have heard this over and over again for the past few months? And you're sitting there going, make it stop. Make it stop. This is what Luke is talking about. The Pharisee represents the ego. He represents I'm holier than thou kind of an attitude. And the publican represents humility. I realize, I admit, I'm wrong. I've done things. I'm a tax collector. I go around making people give me money. How many of you have been met by a tax collector every now and then? That will be coming up soon. But it's either better than the other. Other scripture tells us later that when Jesus talks about the woman who's about to be stoned, whoever has not sinned should cast the first stone. And what does sin mean? It means missing the mark. It's error thinking. It means a belief in separation from God. But we know that wherever we are, God is, and we cannot be separated from our source, our true nature. So to get into this, I want to talk to you a little bit about what is prayer and what is meditation and what does unity believe. But before I do, there was a pastor who began praying with these words, O Lord, without you we are but dust. A little kid sitting next to his mother looked puzzled and leaned over and whispered, Mommy, what is butt dust? (laughs) So, you know, when we take scripture literally, we miss the mark, don't we? Unity has five basic principles for those who may not know or need a refresher. The first principle is there is but one power and one presence active in my life and in the universe. God the good omnipotent. The second principle, which many people overlook, because, you know, if you grew up in the traditional church, you believe that we're all sinners, born in sin and iniquity, worms of the dust. But God didn't make us worms of the dust. God said, I will make man and woman in my image and my likeness, which means... If God is all good, omnipotent, everywhere present, all power, and we're made in the image and likeness of God, we have the same attributes as God. So the second principle of unity is we are made in God's image and likeness, therefore we are inherently good. Now how does that speak to someone who just commits a major crime, a heinous crime? We see they're also made in the image and likeness of God, and they are inherently good. They choose to go in a different direction than who they really are. Because the truth of our being is we are all good. We have goodness in us. We are both human and divine, as our wayshore elder brother and teacher taught us, Jesus Christ. The third principle is the one I'm going to focus on today. It's through prayer and meditation we connect with God. We communicate with God. Now, I grew up in an environment where praying was to be done out loud, robustly, energetically, screaming, yelling. And it reminds me of the story of the the little boy who, it was about Christmas time, and he'd spend the weekend with Grandma. And he and his brother were told by Grandma to get on your knees and say your nightly prayers. 
And so they're on their knees praying, and he's thanking God. She was taught, thank God first for everything. Well, thank you for the food we had for dinner, and thank you for my grandma, and thank you for my mom and daddy. And then he starts yelling really loud, and thank you for that bicycle I'm going to get for Christmas. (laughs) Really loud, thank you for that bicycle I'm going to get for Christmas. And his brother says, why are you screaming? God's not hard of hearing. Yeah, but grandma is. (laughs) (laughs) And being a grandmother, I know exactly what that means. You can ask mom and dad, but ask grandma. You'll probably get it. The fourth principle is we create our reality through the thoughts we choose to think, the way we choose to feel, and what we choose to believe. This is where we get into that sin thing. When we create a reality that goes in an opposite direction of our true nature, who we really are, that's missing the mark. That's what sin means. We're just a little bit off-center. You ever feel a little bit off-center? Have to kind of pull yourself back a little bit? Little, maybe you want to give that one finger salute to somebody who cuts you off in traffic. You're just a little bit off center. Just need to pull yourself back. That's missing the mark. And then the, the final principle that's the most important principle of unity's basic beliefs is it's good to know all those other truths. It's good to know that God is good, all power, all present, all knowing, omnipotent. And that there is only one presence and one power in our lives and in the universe. God the good. That's good. It's good to know that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore we are inherently in our true nature good. It's good to know that we can connect with God immediately through our thoughts, words, and actions. We can communicate with God through prayer and meditation. It's good to know that. It's good to know that we can choose our own reality by the thoughts we choose to think, the way we choose to feel, and what we choose to believe. That's good to know. But none of that matters if you don't put it to use. So the fifth and final principle is we live the truth we know. We live the truth we know. But for today, I'm going to focus on Luke 18 and the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I'm going to focus on the power of prayer and meditation and how unity introduces us to this power. According to the Bible, there are 650 different prayers. 650 approximately. Paul mentions prayer 41 times in his books. And there are 450 recorded answers to prayer in this textbook that unity uses called the Bible. There are records of Jesus praying 25 times during his ministry. And there are even five specific postures to pray. Now, when I was growing up, I was taught that you had to get down on your knees and put your hands together. And I was taught that when you, before you eat your food, you say your grace. You bow your head and you close your eyes and you say your grace. But what I've learned is that every thought is a prayer. So it doesn't matter what, whether you're laying down, standing up, kneeling, running, jogging, working out, whatever you're doing. Every thought is a prayer. In fact, we often sing a song, our thoughts are prayers, and we are always praying. Our thoughts are prayers. Listen to what you're saying. Seek a higher consciousness, a state of peacefulness, and know that God is always there, and every thought becomes a prayer. So it doesn't matter that there might be different positions, you know. Certain religious groups believe you have to kneel and face a certain direction. It doesn't matter what you're doing because Scripture tells us that before they call, I will answer while they yet speak, I will have heard them. What is that saying? We don't have to make a conscious effort. All we have to do is just be. The Father, Mother, God that breathes life into us and sustains us every single breath Here's every thought. So we need to be mindful of what we think. Meister Eckhart said, if the only prayer you ever say is thank you, that is enough. Now meditation is nothing different than silent prayer. When we go into the silence as Myrtle Fillmore, co-founder of Unity, did to heal herself of tuberculosis, we are praying. So even when you're sitting alone doing absolutely nothing, You're praying. There's an old song that I learned growing up as a child. It's an old spiritual, and it goes, 
Couldn't hear nobody pray. Couldn't hear nobody pray. I was way down yonder by myself, and I couldn't hear nobody pray. Well, the truth is, you don't need to hear anybody pray. You're praying whether you realize it or not. Before they call, I will answer. While they yet speak, I will have heard them. So Myrtle Fillmore, especially for uh, Dolores and others who are visiting and maybe Unity for the first time, let me give you a little glimpse into how Myrtle Fillmore used prayer and meditation, which is the foundation of Unity's principles. Myrtle Fillmore in her 40s was told that she had six months to live and she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. She lived in Kansas City, Missouri with her husband Charles and two young sons. Myrtle had been told all of her life that she was sickly. She was a sickly child. She was sick from the time she could walk. She'd always been sick. And that's what people talked about around the dinner. You know, Myrtle's always been sick. Have you ever had somebody say that? You know, I used to be told that I had these habits. My sister would say, if she, she's 10 years older, if she couldn't get me to do what I want, she wanted me to do, she'd tell me, you know, she has her habits on. So that became a mantra in my family. It was like everybody, oh, yeah, you you know, if I was quiet, if I was, I used to draw a lot, and I'd write poems and stories, and if I was not in with everybody else doing whatever they, you know, leave her alone, she's got her habits on. So, you know, I was just being in the silence and didn't even realize it. So I grew up thinking, well, you know, I got these, I got to change myself because people think there's something wrong with me because I have these habits on because I'm not talking or, you know, I'm not, so... Myrtle grew up with this attitude that she was always sick. So it was common knowledge. You know, everybody in the family, well, you know, Myrtle's always been sick. She had a cold. Oh, Myrtle, you know, Myrtle's always been sick. If if anybody's going to get anything, it's going to be Myrtle. I'm sure that's what she heard. So she believed that. She believed it. And so Myrtle went into isolation. She didn't want to talk to anybody. She didn't want to go anywhere. She was just going to die after all. She'd always been sick. She knew it was coming. What else could she expect? The doctor said she had six months to live. So she chose to go ahead and just end her life by not engaging anymore. Her mother-in-law came, took care of the boys, and then a friend kept asking Myrtle and Charles to go with her to hear this speaker, a Reverend E.B. Weeks who was in town from the International New Thought Alliance, and he was going to talk about something about prayer or something that this friend thought would help Myrtle. Myrtle didn't want any help. I've always been sick. Leave me alone. I've always known this day was coming. Now, those probably weren't her exact words. But from what I've read, Myrtle just refused to go. Finally, the friend was so persistent that Charles and Myrtle decided, let's go check this out. And if they're like me, they probably said something like, maybe if we go, she'll shut up and leave us alone. (laughs) So they went. Now, this minister probably said a lot of profound things. Sometimes I'll give a talk. And I'll have all my notes. And somebody will come up to me and say, you know, you really got me when you said thus and so. And I sit there and I did, I didn't say that. Where is that? I did, see, you hear what you want to hear. So I don't know if Reverend E.B. Weeks actually said these exact words, but this is what history records that, that resonated with Myrtle that day. He said, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. Now sit with that for a minute. How many times have you been told that you know you got this from your grandma? Or you know this runs in the family. Well, you know you're probably going to get this because you know your dad had it, your mother had it, your sister had it, your brother had it. How many times have you heard things like that? But Myrtle heard this, and all of a sudden, a light bulb went out, went off. Just like Luke stands for Enlightenment. It was as if Luke was standing there as a beam of light and her, the whole heavens opened up and she heard the sound of music and she thought, oh my God, if this is true, if I truly believe that I'm made in the image and likeness of God, then how can I inherit sickness or disease from my Father God? How about that? So Myrtle decided that she needed to forgive herself and her body and the way she'd been talking about herself. Imagine telling yourself you're diseased and you're sick and you're going to die and you're no no good anymore. So she started reversing that by speaking affirmations. 
of love and health and power and forgiveness and joy and peace to every cell of her body. Myrtle would sit in the silence and talk to her body. She would put hands on herself as Jesus laid hands on people. And she would speak those words aloud and in the silence. After a while, Charles noticed something really different about Myrtle. Myrtle had a little bit of a teeter-totter when she walked. One leg may have been a little shorter than the other. Now, Charles did have a leg that was shorter because he was injured in a skating accident as a boy. But Myrtle walked a little bit like this. And Charles noticed one day that Myrtle wasn't walking quite like that. It's something different about the way Myrtle walked. And he became very curious And he began to look at, what is Myrtle doing? And she started telling him about it. And she was writing friends and family in Ohio, telling them all about how she was speaking words of joy and love and wholeness and health to her body and how she felt good. Myrtle lived another 40 years. She began Silent Unity, the Center for Silent Help, based on the principle of prayer and meditation. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, nonstop, you can call 1-800-NOW-PRAY or 816-969-2000. I know because I call it all the time. And there's a prayer associate on the other end who will make you feel like you're talking to God. No judgment, whatever it is that you're praying, they'll pray with you. They answer silent unity, how may we pray with you? And they keep that prayer for 30 days. They'll send you an email or a letter by regular mail with that prayer, letting you know they're praying with you for your best and highest good. How does unity teach us to pray? Not for this that I want, but for something better. This or something better. That's how you pray. Don't get married to the outcome. Don't be connected to what you think you want because our plans are fit like in this size of a a dream. God's plans for us are so much bigger. So don't limit yourself in your prayers. Always know it's this or something better. And be open and receptive to the good that God has already heard and is already on your way. So Myrtle Fillmore demonstrated this power of the silence. She would sit for hours And just listen to God without saying a word. And then people started asking questions. How can we do that? Can you teach us to pray? Can you show us how you healed yourself? Can you tell us more? Can you start a church? And Charles and Myrtle didn't want anything to do with starting a church, by the way. That was not their plan. So they said, we don't want to take you away from your churches. So how about Wednesday evening? So on Wednesday evenings, people would come to Ninth and Tracy in Kansas City, Missouri and sit on their porch. Or if the weather was cold, they'd sit in the house. And the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger until finally they had to buy a place. The first church is 913 Tracy. Reverend Greg Nettle is restoring that church, and it's beautiful. It's the original that Charles and Myrtle started. The first church that was built from the ground up is Unity Temple on the Plaza, 67 years old. Charles got a chance to shovel the dirt during the groundbreaking, but he didn't live long enough to see it finished. Myrtle had passed away long before that. Myrtle passed in 1931. The church grounds, the, the ground was, was broken. The purchase was made in 28, and the ground was broken in 31. But he wanted that to be a temple in honor of Myrtle. That's where the name Unity Temple comes from. He wanted to honor Myrtle for opening her mind and her heart that created a movement That's worldwide. That's interfaith, non-denominational. Anyone, unity leaves no one out. Anyone can be a part of the unity movement. You already are, whether you're in unity or not. It's all about the one presence and one power active in all of our lives and in the universe. Wherever we are, God is. Myrtle's Myrtle's thinking, and she she read the scripture a lot. She would read scripture and read the teachings of Jesus. That's why unity is based on the principles as taught by Jesus. And that's why we call Jesus our way shore, elder brother, and teacher. Jesus said, these things I do, ye may do also, and even greater works. And even greater works. Isaiah 30, 15 says, in quiet and in confidence 
shall be your strength. What does that mean? In the silence. Everything is in here. There's no out there. There's no God up there, down there, over there, over there. This is the temple of the living God. God is in you. I want to tell you a story about the empty chair. This story really caught my eye, and I hope it grabs you as well. A man's daughter had asked the local minister to come and pray with her father. When the minister arrived, he found the man lying in bed with his head propped up on two pillows and an empty chair beside. The minister assumed the old man had been informed of his visit. I guess you were expecting me, he said. No, who are you, the old man said. I'm the new associate minister at your local church. When I saw the empty chair, I figured you knew I was going to show up. Oh, yeah, the chair, the old man smiled. Would you mind closing the door? I've never told anyone this, not even my daughter, but all my life, I've never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but it was always over my head. I just didn't understand it. Eventually, I abandoned any attempt to pray at all until one day, about four years ago, my best friend said to me, Joe, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with God. Here's what I suggest. Sit down on a chair, place an empty chair in front of you, and in faith, imagine Jesus sitting on that empty chair. It's not spooky because he promised, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of time. Then just speak to him and listen in the same way you're doing with me right now. So I tried, and I've liked it so much, Joe said, that I do it all the time, a couple of hours a day. I'm careful, though, if my daughter ever sees me doing it, talking to that empty chair. She'd either think I've had a nervous breakdown or send me to the funny farm. The minister was deeply touched by the story and encouraged the old guy to continue on the journey. Then he prayed with him and returned to his church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell him that her daddy had passed away that afternoon. Did he seem at peace, the minister asked. Yes, when I left the house around 2 o'clock, he called me over to his bedside, told me one of his corny jokes, and kissed me on the cheek. When I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something strange, she said. In fact, it was beyond strange. It was weird. Apparently, just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head on a chair beside his bed. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Never. That story, I mean, I, it, I have chills just telling you the story. I, it's, it's, it's so powerful. It's this invisible substance that we have at our disposal all the time and we often overlook it. So there are two activities that go on in the mind of prayer. First, persistence. Paul said, pray without ceasing. And then this self-righteousness when we make others wrong to make ourselves right. I'm praying for the perfect outcome of whatever, the election maybe, but I want so-and-so to win, right? So, I mean, I know, we we. We do, we have those kind of prayers, and that's kind of self-righteous when we make others wrong, and that's what the Pharisee was self-righteous in the story that Luke is telling, a self-righteous man. But, my, but, but my, I'm not as bad as he is. I'm better than she is, right? My sin is not as big as yours. So in today's climate, we have all these presidential debates, We're so busy comparing ourselves to other people and comparing other people to each other. So I have something for you. I was sharing earlier that whenever I get ready to give a talk, Spirit just opens up the heavens and sends me stuff, stories, I mean, ideas. And this just, somebody sent this to me on email this week, and I made enough copies for all of you. How many of you have heard of Eric Butterworth? One of the premier unity ministers. He was Unity of New York, Unity at Lincoln Center in New York. My very good friend, Dr. Catherine Thomas, that's how she got introduced to unity. She studied Eric Butterworth. She was good friends with Eric Butterworth. And I recently met uh, the young man who has taken that church over, who studied under Eric, is Reverend Justin Epstein, who's outstanding. Well, somebody sent me this. It's How to Vote for God by Eric Butterworth. The national... Now, this... Eric Butterworth's been dead quite a few years, so this is dated. 
but it's so apropos today. The national election of a president is upon us. The painfully long campaign with politicians pointing with pride and viewing with alarm is drawing finally to a close. The voice of the people will soon speak. Did you know the word vote is related to vow and devoted, both of which came from the Latin votrum, which means a vow or prayer? Thus, in a classical sense, voting is praying, your part in the spiritual process by which growth and change may bless this nation. Religious leaders often attempt to influence the vote of their followers. Some go so far as to proclaim that God's will for the nation is the election of a particular candidate or party. This is a perversion of the democratic process which says the will of God is the will of the people. I need to repeat that. The will of God is the will of the people. And who are the people? We are the people. You can vote for God by voting your conscience with conviction and then having faith that the outcome will have formed through a spiritual process. Thus, a part of the vote should be a vow to accept the result as the outworking of that which is the highest and best for all concerned at this time. They sh there should be no bitterness or fear by those who have lost. On the contrary, there should be a rejoicing that democracy has worked its miracle and all things have worked together for good. I have been asked, should one pray for the outcome of an election? I say, let your prayer be for guidance in your personal vote and for an air of freedom and responsibility throughout the land. Then, trust the process. Let the divine amalgam manifest the leadership and ideals that are right for this period of history. The nation is always bigger than its leaders. I need to repeat that. The nation is always bigger than its leaders. Have faith in the shaping influence of this country's historical destiny and in the divine order process. The moving of the spirit of guidance through the minds of voters is the great election day miracle. The true consent of the governed is to let God work its perfect miracle on Tuesday, November 8th. Your vote is the awareness of prayerful guidance will be your vote for God. Your vote in the awareness of prayerful guidance will be your vote for God. Then no matter what the outcome, call it good in faith that the miracle will continue by lifting the elected leaders to the heights of statesmanship. No truer words were ever spoken. Families are falling out all over the place because they disagree on the current politics as usual, when all we have to do is vote for God. On the back of this, and you'll get this handout, is join us in praying for our country. I didn't know about this either. It's www.presidentialprayerteam.org and it's in its 15th year and it's nonpartisan. So there's a, if you're interested, I put that on the back of this so you can have it. But I thought that was so perfect when we think about how unity teaches us to pray and meditate. You know, we talk, I talked a little bit about how we, when we pray, we sometimes compare. Well, I'm better than so-and-so, or I'm not as bad as so-and-so, so maybe I don't need to pray as much as that person over there down the street, right? They need to pray a lot harder than I do, because I'm better than them, right? I remember hearing Dr. King talk about an old Negro minister, preacher, who said, we ain't what we ought to be. We ain't what we gonna be, want to be, and we ain't what we want to be but thank God we ain't what we was <laughs> so when we think about prayer it's about individuals it's not me praying to heal somebody or praying that I'm better than or affirming that I'm better than someone it's me praying that I can be better than my last best there's a song we sang in Sunday school good better best I'll never let it rest till my good is better and my better best I'm not talking about your good and your best. I need to be talking about me being my best. Those are the kinds of prayers that we need to be saying. You know, Luke and Paul were friends. They were compatriots. And it's interesting that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, after Luke speaks about the power of prayer and how we should not compare ourselves to other people, but pray earnestly within ourselves. 
Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. So that prayer needs to be about me bettering myself. And when I can pray and better myself, then I can influence the world. Prayer is not just for when we are in trouble or in pain or fear. How many times do you wait till something really bad happens or is about to happen? You start praying to God. And prayer is an everyday thing. Like I said, you cannot not pray. Every thought is a prayer. It's a tool in unity, prayer, and meditation or how we communicate with God. Myrtle Fillmore provided this true example through her healing that prayer is a source of inner strength and that meditation is the highest form of prayer. One story in the Bible that always reminds me of the importance of prayer is Daniel in the lion's den. When Daniel, even though he was told that God wouldn't save him. He was, you know, his God wasn't important. His God wasn't that powerful. He wasn't everywhere present, all-knowing. And there were those who were jealous of Daniel. They wanted to get rid of him. So they tricked the king into coming up with a plan that if he caught anyone praying, that they would be fed to the lions. Well, Daniel was true to his word. He was true to his conviction. He was true to his beliefs. How many times have you been tempted to not let people know what you believe because they might not like you? You don't need to do or say anything because the principle in unity, the fifth principle is we live the truth we know. We walk our talk. You don't have to tell anybody what you believe. You walk your talk. So Daniel continued to walk his talk. He continued to pray. Even though he heard the edict was if they caught somebody praying to their God instead of to the king, that they would be fed to the lions. He wasn't afraid. Because he knew who he was and who his God was. And he was caught praying. And when the lions came, they put him in the lion's den. God shut the lion's mouth. This happens in politics too. My mother would say, the Lord will fight your battles if you just keep still. And what does that mean? Go within. Take a deep breath. Relax. Go into the silence. Allow the spirit in you, which is greater than anything in the world, to enable you to overcome whatever obstacle you're facing. Paul said, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we may not have the dramatic experience that Paul ha- that Daniel had in the lion's den, It may not be that visible, where we're, hopefully not, where we're in a den and all these hungry lions are coming and we're praying to our God. We may not have that vivid of an experience, but we all go through some experience where we feel like everything is is caving in on us. Prayer and meditation are the answers. And you don't have to, there's no formality. You don't have to do any certain thing. You don't have to kneel and face the east. You don't have to do anything out of the ordinary. Just be and allow the spirit to breathe through you. Allow the spirit to feel your being. You are the light of the world. All you have to do is let your light shine. There was a little boy who wanted a baby brother. He was five years old, and he was, you know, an only child, and he wanted a companion. So he begged his mom and daddy, could they go get him a baby brother? The daddy told him that if he prayed for 30 days, that God would answer his prayers and give him a baby brother. So Every night for a whole month, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed, and nothing happened. He went around the neighborhood where his friends had younger brothers and sisters, and He he couldn't figure out why his family, you know, he was doing all this praying and they said they didn't pray for a baby brother or sister. Some of them didn't even want one. And they had one. And he thought, well, this prayer thing isn't working. So he stopped. He stopped praying. About a month later, his mother comes home from the hospital and his father calls him up to their room and he pulls back the cover and there's not just one baby, but two baby brothers. His mother had given birth to twin boys. Oh, he was in heaven. His father said, aren't you glad you prayed? He said, aren't you glad I stopped? (laughs) (laughs) 
To be effective, always know that your thoughts are prayers. And when you pray, go into that secret place. No one has to know but you because you have a direct line to your father, mother, God. You don't need an operator like we used to have in the old days on a party line. You have a direct connection. You don't need an intercessory. You have a direct connection. You don't need anybody. You directly communicate with God. Luke was saying to us, I'm good because, the Pharisee says, I'm good because uh, there are others that are worse off than me. Have you heard that lately? I'm superior because there are others who are inferior. So that makes me better. When I pray, I'm, you know, I'm on top of the world. My prayers are heard first because I'm better than those other people. But spirit doesn't judge us or compare us to others, but according to our own individual's consciousness, our own state of awareness. So this parable, Luke 18, 9 through 14, is about self-improvement. That's what it's all about. Look at yourself. In fact, Luke was known as a physician, and there is a statement in the Bible that says, Physician, heal thyself. How many times have we looked outside of ourselves trying to fix other people? I know I, I try to do that, try to fix them. Physician, heal thyself. An original, by the way, is worth more than a copy. So when you're working on yourself, you're, you're improving that Rembrandt that you already are, that Picasso that you already are. So in closing, I just want to give you a few other tips about prayer and the silence. Be humble. That's what the, the tax collector, the publican, was about. Humility. I know I've sinned. I know I've done wrong. I know I haven't. Acknowledge that. Be humble. Be grateful. Always give thanks. Paul said, pray without ceasing and, every, and give thanks. Pray for others, no matter how different they may appear in their looks, their attitudes, their beliefs. And remember, heal thyself. Heal thyself. I have another handout to give you that I think you'll enjoy called I'm Thankful. And I won't read that, but I'll I'll share that with you. So two things, how to vote for God, three things. On the back of that is the presidential prayer organization that's free. And then I am thankful. Pray with gratitude and pray without ceasing. And now we'll begin our meditation and put that to practice. I invite you to find a comfortable position in your seats. And just close your eyes when you're when you feel ready and just relax. Pause in this moment as you allow spirit to restore your natural balance and just breathe. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Feel the peace of this quiet moment wash over you. And feel your body begin to relax. Grateful for this pause in your day. Turn your attention inward. As you listen within the sanctuary of your own soul. From this place of inner quiet, you can hear the sweet whispers of spirit guiding you, calling you, directing you in all aspects of your life. And just breathe. As you continue to quiet your mind, you become more open and receptive to God's guiding presence. God is pure love God is a light unto your feet and a lamp unto your path. God reveals new depths of wisdom and understanding that are within you now. If worrisome thoughts enter your mind, you can remain peaceful and undisturbed just by letting them go. 
Don't fight them. Just breathe. And mentally wave them by as if they are soft, billowy clouds. Just let go and let God. God is in charge of your life. Acknowledge any anxious thoughts without holding on to them or believing in them. Just let them go. Feel your heartbeat. Call those thoughts of peace to come forward from that inner place of peace. Trust the spirit within you. God's essence is whispering I love you. I love you in the silence. I invite you now to slowly and gently return your attention to your body and to this place and time. Hear the voice of God gently whispering within you, I love you. You are safe and guided along life's way. I love you.